If we want to understand our planet and its history, we need to answer some questions. How old are the rocks? When did various geological units form? Now we can use the relationships between rock units and textures to place geological stories in their relative order. But to calibrate a time scale, we need to get absolute ages. This film introduces how we do this using radiometric dating. It's based on fundamental nuclear physics tied to understanding isotope geology. So we'll cover a bunch of territory, starting with a refresher on isotopes and how some are unstable. Parent isotopes decaying to new daughter elements, which leads us to the basic concept in radioactivity, exponential decay, the idea of half-lives and how these are applied to age dating through decay constants. So these foundations lead to radioisotope interpretation through isotope diagrams and the plotting of isochrons. We'll assess assumptions and tests and the importance of inherited daughters, which leads to some case studies all tied to the rubidium strontium dating system. Right, let's kick off with a refresher. Isotopes, they're about the nuclei of atoms. Consider oxygen, atomic number eight. The nucleus has 19 protons, but it comes with different numbers of neutrons, and these define three isotopes. For oxygen, these are stable, so they're not radioactive. Rubidium, on the other hand, atomic number 37, has these isotopes, and 87 rubidium with 50 neutrons is unstable. It's radioactive. In general, there are different types of radioactive decay. Here, the unstable nucleus decays to emit an alpha particle, essentially a helium nucleus. For example, 238 uranium, atomic number 92, decays to 234 thorium, atomic number 90. So the uranium isotope is the parent and the thorium is the daughter element. Now, for another decay scenario. Here, the nucleus decays to emit essentially an electron, which means a neutron becomes a proton, moving the isotope one place up the periodic table. 87 rubidium, atomic number 37, decays to 87 strontium, atomic number 38. We'll use this system as our dating tool later in this film. These decay processes are driven by these principles well tested in nuclear physics. That decay is a simple probability. The odds don't change for a given parent isotope under geological conditions. So let's develop these ideas and look at exponential decay. It's about probability. In this illustration, we have a collection of our parent isotopes and at any increment of time, the probability of an individual isotope decaying is one sixth. So you can play along with a stack of dice. Let's let the experiment run. Number of atoms of the parent isotope progressively decrease. And because at each step, the number of parent atoms is reduced, the number of daughters created reduces too, as the probability of any single decay event is constant. And the numbers tail off. This is exponential decay, and the half-life of the parent isotope, where the original number is reduced by 50%, is here. This is our timekeeper, our geochronometer, and we can use it for most of the history of the decay subject to the analytical sensitivity of our instruments. The behaviour can be expressed like this, where the ratio of parent atoms remaining to those at the start is a function of the time and the decay constant, a fixed value for any particular radioactive isotope. These are half-lives of commonly used geochronometers. In this film, we'll be using 87 rubidium, which has this huge half-life of nearly 50 billion years. This equates to a tiny decay constant the probability of any particular atom of 87 rubidium decaying 
in the course of a year. This was determined by comparing analyses of samples whose age was defined by another isotope geochronometer. This value was calculated by actually counting the number of decay events for a known amount of 87 rubidium over a staggering 19 year experiment. And there have been other counting experiments. Nowadays, the decay constant is based on several experiments. The differences between these numbers is pretty small. The choice of decay constant might impact on the precision of the age you calculate, but not really its accuracy. So 87 rubidium decays via the emission of a beta particle to create a daughter isotope, 87 strontium. Strontium has another common isotope, 86 strontium, that's not radiogenic. This system is useful because these elements, rubidium and strontium, are relatively common in a wide range of rocks and minerals. So the geochemistry can be tied to their geological formations. Rubidium substitutes for potassium, while strontium substitutes for calcium, both common elements in a range of different minerals. Their isotopes have been measured for decades on generations of mass spectrometers. So that's exponential decay, the foundation of our geochronometers, measurements of parent-daughter ratios. And this will get us the age of our rocks. So the next thing is to introduce how data are displayed. I'll take this slowly and in an idealized fashion. Consider being able to simply chart the number of parent and daughter atoms in a sample as the sample gets older. We'll start simply here with only parent atoms, but over time, these decay to daughters. So the daughters increase in number as the parents decay away. This shows the evolution of the composition of our sample. We can draw a line between our parent-daughter data point to the graph's origin. So as the sample gets older, the slope of this line increases. The slope of the line relates to the age of the sample. This type of diagram is called an isotope plot. So measure the concentration of daughter versus parent isotope atoms, construct the tie line to the origin and calculate the slope given the decay constant of a specific parent isotope. But this is using only one data point. So as an approach, it's hard to assess its accuracy. So we need something better, which brings us to isochrons. Again, a simple illustration. Vary the concentration of parent isotope atoms in a set of samples of the same size, in this case, 100 atoms. The probability of any atom of parent isotope is constant. So each of the samples, if they have the same age, will generate a different absolute number of daughter atoms over the same time period, but in the same proportion to the number of parents. So let's see how this works. At the onset age, we'll have no daughters. Consider this sample with a low concentration of parents. After a fixed time, say 40% of the parents will have decayed. So our composition of parents and daughters plot here. Now a sample with a greater concentration of parents. After the same fixed time period passed and the same probability of decay as for the first sample, we get this concentration of parents and daughters. OK, let's add a couple more samples and allow these to evolve over the same time period with the same decay constant. We get this plot. So if the probability of decay is the same for all parent atoms and the duration, the age of our sample, is the same for all of them, then they plot on a straight line. This is an isochron. The samples are the same age as each other. Before we move on to get nearer a real situation, we need to discuss a requirement of the approach, which is throughout its history, during the decay, each sample has to be closed so we can perform a robust audit of the numbers of parent and daughter atoms. The rock or a constituent mineral we're analysing has to have been closed. But what if the sample leaks? What's the impact on our plot? Let's answer this by looking at one sample. If some of the daughter isotopes can diffuse out, the data point falls below the isochron. 
If both parents and daughters can partly escape, then the data point might plot here. Or more daughters might diffuse in, again moving the data point off the isochron. It might be hard to tell from the sample if these leaky behaviour patterns have happened. But if we can plot isochrons so that we expect data to plot on a single straight line, and we have lots of data points, then leaks are unlikely to have happened and our age is likely to be very reliable. We'll check on this later when we look at real data. Next up, it's the issue of inherited atoms of the daughter isotope. Consider a sample which has parent atoms and a mixture of atoms of the element that includes the radiogenic daughter isotope and a non-radiogenic isotope of the daughter element. The catch is we can't tell how much of the radiogenic isotope was formed by decay of parents at once in the sample and which were incorporated as the rock was formed. Let's explore this with three samples we've collected from the same geological formation, say a granite. The idea is that this formation crystallised from a melt with a mixture of atoms, parents and an initial mixture of the daughter element, some of the radiogenic isotope and some of the non-radiogenic isotope. And that the two isotopes, radiogenic and non-radiogenic of the daughter element, behave the same chemically, so are incorporated into components of the final geological formation in the same proportions. This is termed the initial ratio. So let's let our original geology get old. So daughter radiogenic isotopes are added at the expense of parent atoms. So over time, three samples have evolved from this to this. But as geologists, we measure this, unable to discriminate between new and original daughter radiogenic isotope atoms. So let's plot this up and we'll plot ratios against the amount of the non-radiogenic isotope of the daughter element. Analyze parents versus analyzed radiogenic daughters, new and inherited because we can't tell them apart. So sample one has this composition. Parents versus non-radiogenic isotope, that's 18 to 2, plot here. And total radiogenic, 9 plus 1 equals 10 to 2, plots here. So here's the sample 1 on the plot. Sample 2 plots here. Sample 3 plots here. Three distinct samples from the same overall geological formation, which define a three-point isochron. The samples are all the same age, and this intercept gives the initial ratio of radiogenic and non-radiogenic isotopes of the daughter element. They have the same initial proportions, the same initial ratio from sample to sample. So our samples formed here, and over time the isotopic compositions have evolved as the parent isotopes decayed over the same time period. So the data plot on an isochron the slope of which, given the parent's decay constant, gives the age since the geological formation crystallised and the radioactive clocks started running. Isochrons then. These are the key. The more data points, the more analyses, the more robust the result. So it's time to look at real examples using the rubidium-strontium system. The case studies are classic examples in geochronology. They use measurements of isotopic ratios, the parent isotope 87 rubidium and two isotopes of strontium 87, which is the radiogenic daughter, and 86, the non radiogenic isotope of strontium. There's remained a debate as to the decay constant to use for 87 rubidium, but these values are really not that different. So the geochronological studies yield accurate results, though the precision is harder to assess. So first up, how old is the solar system? Meteorites give us the answer. They're the oldest rocks from Earth, even though they're extraterrestrial. 
They're far older than any of the Earth's own rocks. And many meteorites are found sitting on Antarctic ice, easy to spot in a white world. We're going to look at some special meteorites called chondrites. They're made of small blobs called chondrules. These are materials that never made planets. They didn't coagulate and differentiate into large planetary masses. So there's stuff left over from planetary accretion at the birth of the solar system. Jean-Francois Manster and colleagues in Paris analysed several suites of chondrites. Each data point is from a distinct meteorite. Here's the first chondrite type. And another and a third, and they lie on a remarkable isochron from which Manster and colleagues determined an age of 4,555 million years. It's a remarkable and stunning study. There are so many data points, you can't really argue about the accuracy of the age. You may quibble about the precision as it depends on the exact evaluation of the decay constant of 87 rubidium, but it won't change the age by a huge percentage. Our solar system and its constituent planets formed around four and a half billion years ago. Other meteorites tell us about early planets, but that story is for another time. Now let's look at the moon and the lunar mare, those huge dark patches and the site of the first manned landing of Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin returned samples, including these basalts, which were quickly dated. The whole rock was analysed, as were different constituent minerals, and these define an isochron. The age of the Lunar Mare basalt is 3,610 million years old. Now let's leave the moon and head to Earth. And we're off to Greenland, some of the oldest continental crust on our planet. So it's attracted a lot of geochronological interest, despite the insect life and some of the difficulties doing field work in these landscapes. Here's a study of a rather young part of the rock sequence on Greenland, a granite complex, analysed by Steve Moorbarth and colleagues. And here are the data which form a neat isochron, defining this age over two and a half billion years old. These rocks are old, but they're actually amongst the youngest in this corner of Greenland. This area has seen lots of detailed mapping and allied geochronological campaigns. This cross-hatched area is the Quarkart granite complex, but the surrounding gneisses have been dated as being at least 3.89 billion years old. Values come from uranium lead dating, spot ages from zone zircon crystals, measured using a shrimp, that's a sensitive high resolution iron micropo, technology pioneered at ANU in Canberra. Shrimp zircon ages are the front line of deep time studies in the continental crust. But more on this is for another film. Here, we've been looking at the rubidium strontium system and the use of isochrons that combine analyses from multiple samples or analyses of minerals from the same geological formation, a pioneering and powerful method that nowadays has been applied to other isotope systems. And there are other methods too, including the uranium lead system I've just mentioned, looking at zircons from Greenland. Modern Earth science has lots of geochronometers which are giving consistent results about the ages of Earth materials. If you want to take this further, try these sources. There's lots of material out there to consult. This film has just been a taster of how we can date rocks and get a timeline on the evolution of our planet. Thank you for watching.